Hate Space Ghettos deals with the deep-rooted inequalities and a history of communal violence that has led to segregated urban spaces today. In 2002, one of the worst communal riots broke out in Ahmedabad and claimed the lives of nearly a thousand Muslims. Hindu-Muslim violence that began in the 1960s altered the urban fabric of the city forever. With each violent clash, community boundaries became more rigid and many Muslims began to be pushed out to the new ghettos forming at the periphery. This project was thus a way for me to understand my city better and to discover the many invisible boundaries that takes over the way we live our lives. Spatial segregation on the basis of religion is spreading across India and the relevance of this project stems from ghettoization becoming a very real fear amidst the changing political climate. Ahmedabad today is one of the most segregated cities with nearly 60% of its Muslim population living in a concentrated area. And this is Johapura. The ghetto is a neglected, isolated part of the city far from major institutions and landmarks and in close proximity to toxic infrastructure like sewage treatment plants and garbage dumps. It has poor connection to public transportation, a landscape with hardly any green spaces, poor road infrastructure and networks, and lack of proper drainage and sanitation. People from all socio-economic backgrounds live here. It houses both rich and poor Muslims, much like what was seen in Jewish ghettos of Nazi Germany. Its most disturbing edge, however, is along the north of the ghetto. The Hindu community living there has built a 5-6 to six meter boundary wall to separate themselves from the ghetto. So when social practices have a direct effect on conditions of the built environment, and the spatial location of a community in the city further worsens its social conditions, architecture must thus strive to evolve as a practice beyond the design of static buildings. The wall built by the city to keep people within the confines of the ghetto becomes a symbol of despair, a lack of identity and the inability for a marginalised community to choose their interface with the city. The intent is thus to invert these very conditions of confinement, freedom and social exclusion for the ghetto by creating a voluntary exclusionary periphery. So what if we continue to indulge in this megalomaniac love for building walls in cities only this time, those oppressed in the past use it as a way to build their own city within the city. And what then is the framework for such a speculation? The periphery of the ghetto is populated with a series of institutions that a city would contain. All the amenities of the ghetto are pushed out to the edge, making the somewhat loose edges now a tangible boundary. These also become anchors to the infill coming between them, which is imagined as housing the people of Juhapura. As people move to the periphery, a void is created that can be used for farming, recreation and systems for self-sustenance of the community. As a peripheral social housing model develops, this hopes to erase the inequalities found within the ghetto as well. The housing can now be built as either single row, double row or partially connected structures between the anchors. And the various ways in which the housing can take shape allows for many possibilities of the master plan to develop in the future. For the project, three towers have been detailed. The first is the cultural tower. Its monolithic nature is suggestive of bastions at a periphery, while it strategically engages with the city at upper levels. And as the housing begins to enclose this periphery, the ghetto becomes a world of its own. Sectionally as well, the building tries to create relationships between programs like the Women's Centre, a market and a prayer space. The towers are enveloped by an 800mm thick debris concrete wall that becomes an expression of identity through the architecture as well. They also try to develop a distinct response to the outside and the park. The next is an infrastructure tower that holds a gateway to the inside, marking an important landmark to enter the site once the housing has developed. The tower has space for hydroponics and a water tank to add to the self-sustenance of the community and also spaces for the ghetto and city to meet. The pedestrian thoroughfare at the lower levels opens out to the void created inside the ghetto. The last is the educational tower, which includes recreational spaces, a madrasa and a library. Combining such programs will hopefully allow some of the prejudices of religious education to be done away with. The library at the top brings different people together within the same space. So with every new edge of the ghetto developed, there grows the strength and resilience of a hopeful community. However, the onus of whether a ghetto becomes a city of its own lies with those on the outside. Its hostile edges turn into fortifications while the others remain dotted with institutions that it can share with the city. And yet there remains discrimination threatening marginalised communities and with each new ghetto formed lies the potential for yet another city to emerge. How many walls will be built before we realise the problem was the wall to begin with?